Hello, makers, crafters, and builders, and welcome to the Irish Makers Podcast. This episode, we are talking to representatives of makerspaces from all over the island of Ireland. Makerspaces of all types are growing at an exponential rate. So a makerspace is a collective work environment. They can be inside schools, inside libraries. They can be separate to public buildings or private buildings. And they're basically a facility where people can learn how to use tools. They can share ideas and they can create stuff. It's in the name. They're makerspaces. You can make whatever you want in these spaces. And there's so many people there to teach you how to make. These spaces are open to kids, adults, and entrepreneurs, and they have a variety of maker equipment, including 3D printers, laser cutters, CNC machines, soldering irons, and even sewing machines. So today, we're going to be joined by Maeve Murphy from Bench Space down in Cork. We're then going to be joined by Art Condre Tiav, who's up in Belfast for Farset Labs, and then Stuart Lawn, who's from Maker Lab Hub Hub sorry, Fab Lab Maker Hub out in Leitrim. So let's jump right into our first guest, Maeve. So Maeve Murphy is coming to us from Bench Space down in Cork. Bench Space is an open access factory offering industrial grade tools, technology, and business support for professional makers and creative startups. It gives creatives the tools they need to turn an idea or a skill into a successful enterprise. Through a series of workshops, peer networking, and mentorship and industry engagement opportunities, Bench Space creates uh, creatives navigate all aspects of developing a creative livelihood. Maeve Murphy is an advocate for the Irish craft and design scene. She holds a BA in design and textiles from GMIT and a master's in cultural policy and arts management from UCD and has over 10 years experience working in the arts. She's also an entrepreneur. She set up her own business and she's also a board member of the Design and Craft Council of Ireland. Maeve, how are you doing today? Good morning, Nathan. How are you? I'm great. I'm reading about Bench Space and I'm absolutely floored. Like it actually, I've seen pictures of it and it looks incredible. Like, like look at these pictures. Like I, I've never, I've never been so jealous to want to go down to Cork. It's still, it's still a work in progress. Um, but yeah, um, we're tipping away and constantly expanding. So we opened up in 2017 with just a professional manufacturing wood workshop. So that was the focus initially. Okay. And we're expanding it into fine metal work, which will be jewellery and um, eventually textiles. But we have an architectural designer in there as well. We have a lot of people using our laser cutter coming in on day passes or even we fine artists and um, using our laser cutter to kind of up their production into their, um, especially glass artist uh, in terms of her production on making molds. So it's loads of different types of people using the space. That's crazy. So, so basically, you've got a makerspace that's pitching to artists and intra- entrepreneurs and basically being a hub for them to help them do better. Yeah. So we would look at everything through an enterprise lens. So the idea is that mm. we, when, when graduates leave college um, or someone who's working a nine to five job and they want to completely change the direction in what they're working in and studying that they can come to bench space and explore that and see that there is an opportunity and a possibility to have a sustainable livelihood in a creative career because that that goes back to it was on your website actually and it just says bench space allows makers to turn their passions into a profession which i think is, is an absolutely brilliant way of phrasing it so tell me you've obviously you're viewing everything from an enterprise lens which is great there's so many people out there who want to uh, commercialize or turn their passions again into a profession do you find that do you have open spaces for people who realistically they're they're not trying to do that they just want to keep it a hobby or how does that work yeah so we have we run actually classes nearly every evening and um, mainly in woodwork at the moment but we have some laser cutting as well and um, like a complete intro for beginners for laser cutting and then people who might be familiar with the basics um, of the design element of it and just need a quick ways around how to use our particular laser cutter. And in that, you can go from complete beginner in joinery and wood to up to you be able to use the machines. But then we actually have once a month, we've open making sessions where okay. people can come in. Uh, that is manned by a volunteer um, and people can come in with their project and idea and bounce and troubleshoot things off the volunteer that's there and tip away for a few hours in the space. That's amazing. Like you, you obviously have, that's such an incredible resource to have. So t- tell me, 
how how does that how do you receive funding like like how do you fund something like this because it I, I, from someone who's been in a hell of an awful lot of maker spaces they're not cheap to run laser cutters are not cheap to to purchase and tools are horrendously expensive and insurance costs are through the roof these days oh, so how yeah. does one how do you yeah. keep the lights on our uh, yeah we not, insurance was a major issue for us uh two years ago um we are an enterprise ireland red F project so uh, in 2020, uh, REDF means Regional Enterprise Development Fund. So Benchspace applied for funding to Enterprise Ireland to expand and develop its uh, operations. And a part of that expansion was bringing an operations manager on, which was myself. So we got a, an injection of funding to roll out this expansion, focusing on enterprise development for creative businesses. Um, that is divided into different buckets of uh, funding that we can spend on different elements. Uh, one of them being, let's say, bringing experts in to talk about how you can commercialize your business. Um, and also capital expenditure that is locked onto having a certain property. And we can tap into that once we have a property. And that's like buying amazing equipment. We Our classes are really great and important revenue stream for us. Mm. Um, so all our classes are listed on the website. Um, and that's, that is, that happens all year round. So that's a really good income stream for us. And then if a business or a startup or a maker wants to come in and use the space, um, we actually have a, a lot of queries from people who do work nine to five jobs, but they want uh, their other half might not want them in the house taking over their whole ha house with it, um, or they don't have a room <laughs> so um, they can they hire a space so our prices are quite affordable for access to all of the equipment as well so that is another revenue stream for us too and um, we get support also from the design and craft council of ireland because we are a gans organization and a gans is gills association networks and society and that's what GAN stands for. And we also work with the local enterprise office in Cork City um, and uh, Cork County as well on different supports. And um, we have, let's say, one a bursary that's a 12 month bursary where a maker has an opportunity to come and spend have their studio costs paid for the whole year. And they also get 10,000 euro stipend for them to spend on whatever they want for their living so they can actually uh, give uh, their creative business a go for a whole year. So we do we work in partnership with a lot of regional and national organizations um, and be that then tapping into funding as well to run the space. But we the aim is in three years time for a bench space to be sustainable and it would not have to rely wow. on external program. Yeah. Like that'd be an incredible place to be and like just well done. First off, well, that... and, <laughs> and now I have to give I'm I'm with Benchspace uh, just over a year, so I would like the founders of Benchspace have brought it to where it is, and it is as a it's a social enterprise, not for profit. So everything, yeah. uh, any money that is made from any of our courses or anything is all reinvested back into Benchspace to the to develop the mission, achieve its objectives. So um like everything it's it's all circular and that's it's is there any way of rolling this kind of model out to the rest of the country like you have one in cork we don't really have something to this scale in dublin which i find mad yeah, it, it's actually so there's a lot of mature models and um, which we and um, part of actually our, our enterprise ireland funding is a travel fund for us to go traveling other similar spaces so i'll be hopping up to the lads um up north um soon enough because um, we want to visit other best practices and um, to see how they do things. So we actually went over to the UK and uh, visited similar models and um, hope to be going over to Europe later this year and maybe the US. Um, bench space, we have had a good few people asking, could it be uh, replicated? So as it is, the, t t the particular type of space it is, it is the only one in Ireland. Um, mm. Uh, in terms of, let's say, for enterprise support, it could be. I think we would certainly be like I've had a lot of people contacting us wondering how we do things and like what are the stumbling blocks and always open to people calling us. We are still making mistakes. We also uh, are part of a Western hub corridor for 
co like working spaces, even though we're not a co working space as such, we're like a co making space. And um, so we learn from also our peers in their co working hubs and seeing what they do and what they like, you know what they works and what doesn't work for them. But in terms of yes, in time we would love to have there be a bench space Dublin, bench space wherever. And um, but it's a case of getting it right here first. It's because it takes it's it's a lot. It's a significant yeah, I can imagine. Amount. So in terms of classes, kind of what what kind of your main focus on class and how would how can if you want to say anything to our listeners about bringing more people in, what would you say? Oh, it's like if you want to just use your hands, switch off, uh, develop new skills. Mainly, mainly right now it's wood, but we're going to have some amazing fine metal work workshops. We got to take a a puck welder, which is like a really fine precision tick yeah, welder, yeah, yeah. um, into the space. We're going to be giving master classes on that. Um, so just check out our classes laser cutters that's like for complete beginners and with that actually we give a a one day free pass trial because we don't want you just using doing the course and then not putting into practice what you've learned we want you to come back into space have fun explore and make all the mistakes while you still can at the beginning uh, so i completely get that my wife always says to me uh, I've, I've got 3d printers in here i've got resin printers i've got old train lights in here and my wife's always said to me, she said, Nathan, you can't have lasers. And I was like, fair, that's fair. I'll have everything else, but I'm not allowed to have lasers. So like, I, basically, maker spaces exist to me to provide me with lasers. <laughs> yeah, it's like, we, call, we actually call it the gateway drug uh, of the machines because it's so easy to use. Visually, you can see results straight away. So we're going to talk to Art Kondratyev, uh, who's coming to us from Belfast from Farsat Labs Hackerspace. So Farsat Labs is a community funded and volunteer operated charity opened in 2012 as a place for creativity and technological tinkering. Where they're open to everyone, no matter what they do, and they're welcome people from all walks of life to use the space, come to their events and make a maker community in Northern Ireland. So Art is a tech professional with a specialization in cybersecurity. Over the past 10 years, he's organized hundreds of events. He's a favorite in the community. He's been working in the lab all night, or so he said to us in the green room. And we just want to talk to him and ask him a couple of questions about it. How are you doing, Art? It's great to be here, Nathan. I am a little tired from that all nighter, but other than that, this I just love the energy on this podcast. Oh, thank you so much. Yeah, it it, it, it takes an awful lot of sugar. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, <laughs> Art, coffee. tell us about Farsat Labs. Tell us about how it got started yeah. and kind of what you're doing up there. I look, I'm looking at these pictures and I love the breakdown and it looks incredible. You have such an amazing space here. And it's such a good time to look at it as well because we're about to reach our 10th birthday since opening our doors in April 2012. So it's going to be a bit of a party, uh, bringing people uh, that that maybe have been part of the space, you know, a few years back, stayed in touch, and just show them how far we've taken it. What do you kind of do in your makerspace? So what we used to do, um, and actually how we got started is we are we call ourselves the hackerspace. You know, the hackerspace makerspace it gets changed a lot. But I think there's mm. a core bit of that where the the idea of how a hacker space works, it's people coming together, you know, out of interest, more so than maybe a professional way uh, uh, or a, a structured or form, formal way of, of doing things like an enterprise. Um, it's a bit of a clubhouse, right? It's kind of that how we started. You know, uh, Andrew, uh, one of the founders, traveled to the upper conferences and brought this idea back to Belfast. So how it started was friends coming together, sharing equipment, found a building, brought more people in. And it was really focused around um, kind of university level skill, right? You mm -hmm. know, in, di in different areas, physics, uh, electronics, uh, programming. But over the past while, we've started moving towards something more open where we're trying to find uh, ways for anybody to get interested in kind of STEAM uh, fields and just pursue those interests so we're trying to open up the channel of who can get involved and how they can get involved. We're developing our workshop facilities. We're opening new things that probably, I don't know, we haven't seen before, like a media studio. We're building voice booths. Uh, I, I've, I've never seen one before, but one I'll time- I'll take my invitation I, I, in the post, I, I assume. Art, I, I assume our invitation is in the post to that media studio. Absolutely. <laughs> Go on. Um, yeah, and I walked in and I saw a, a studio being built. And it turned out that a bunch of us started exploring this uh, way of, of you know, a growing online presence for different events we're doing. 
So we've had uh, Kalen bringing in a, a bunch of equipment for the Global Game Jam in Northern Ireland, Raspberry Jam that, that he's working with. I brought in some of my equipment. Uh, we had uh, somebody join that's a professional voiceover artist who mm -hmm. actually helped us design a bit of the space. And we're now building a streaming, streaming area there as well. That's amazing. So, like, I guess for the uninitiated, a maker space and a hacker space, there, there is, there is in fact a difference. So, a hacker space, as far as I'm aware, is coming from C base in Berlin. It's when the first hacker spaces really got started, and the focus is very much more on technology and the creation of turning technology into something to do something it wasn't initially intended to do. And as you said, it is more of a, a clubhouse atmosphere, whereas maker spaces, are very much popularized from the U.S. in San Diego and San Francisco, have taken a more definitely a more commercial outlook uh, in terms of taking people from the art side of steam as opposed to very much the stem side of it so in terms of farset on that point do you think there is a bigger focus on the stem side or a bigger focus on the the, the a and the steam so since i joined uh, i'm trying to join those two together and also mm. that's a, a big thing that uh, another one of the directors andrew uh, one of the early founders as well, andrew's involved in everything <laughs> with, with, with connecting kind of data and art for me, it's about letting people pursue technological uh, creativity. So but by that, I don't, I don't mean programming. I, I mean, really getting into like, how do I understand this thing I'm doing? So if you're, for example, you know, a painter, you might really explore different techniques of doing things. And that's the kind of thing I'm trying to enable. Uh, right now, I'm focusing on doing it with machines, so for example, 3D printing facilities, uh, we're trying to bring in a bit of t-shirt printing, you know, we've had, uh, oh, we cool. built something, it, it kind of wobbled about, we took it apart, <laughs> but we're trying things. Um, so it, so in terms of like the hacker space of being a more of a grassroots thing, less than commercial, that's part of our spirit. But at the same time, we're doing the kind of, the, we're bringing in the makers, uh, over the past while. And obviously how do you make we've had a chat with Benchbase and we're trying to understand how they make it financially viable. How does Farset make the makerspace viable? So interestingly, um, a lot of new spaces coming forward, they, they get a lot of subsidized funding, which means you don't need to worry about um, membership income, for example, things like that. We are keeping our lights on entirely with our uh, memberships. Wow. We had a, we had, yeah, we had a bit of su subsidy <laughs> during COVID times. Uh, where uh, as part of a program we were running, we asked, look, can you give us a bit of COVID relief money, which covered about, you know, almost one month rent for us. But other than that, uh, it's entirely member funded, but we do make a little bit of an exception where whenever we want to grow our equipment, uh, we uh, typically run a program. So it might be a program for like a few weeks, and it might be a one day thing, but we organize some effort to get new equipment we do something cool with it maybe teach people things and then we keep it and then we i've keep seen it this equipment. i've seen this on your website vicky if you could pull up the uh, just pull up the image there of it it's just from the website um yeah you see there and then you obviously you can see all the completed projects and then all the ones you're trying to keep funding so like how do you raise that how do you raise those funds for all those different projects so with the latest one we're working on now called 100 makers so maker spaces um one of our members found a program in, in their company that said, hey, you, you can uh, put in a bit of a, you know, an application to say, we're going to do something cool in my community uh, and you can get a few thousand pounds for it. So we actually had uh, that member succeed in getting an application, got the project started and left the company. <laughs> so, so, you know, we rejected a little bit, but, but it's still working out. And we got about 8,000 pounds worth of funding uh, to bring oh, wow. in cool. all, all, all of the new Prusa printers to the space and a whole lot more. The Prusa printers, those yeah. things are amazing. Like, like, like that's that's mwah, peak three D printing. You know, other people say Ultimaker, but like I've never heard someone say, "Oh, Prusa printer, that didn't work for me." They just work. They're just like the most hardest working printers I've ever seen. Every other printer I've ever had has just died, but the Prusa printer just. Mwah. I, 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 one final question, actually. Um, so obviously we're we're trying to pitch to all of Ireland, uh, the island, and we're talking to everyone. So. How have you found the interaction being with uh, south of the border uh, in terms of makers down here? Or do you think it's quite very much focused on kind of Northern Ireland uh, and you kind of deal with that sort of community? Or do you think there's a, a cross border element of it? Do you have many people who don't know about you down south or do you have much of a contact across the border? 
So we actually, I think the down, down south, you do a much better job. We visited Tog, you know, we had people coming in to do lock picking workshops. Of course, everybody knows Tog for the lock picking workshops. And I've met Vicky uh, on, on some other calls. Um, so I think that the down south community is really good at reaching out. On our side, we could we could probably do, well, we could definitely do a bit better. Being a volunteer run space, entirely volunteer run, it is a bit harder, especially with the pressures of COVID on many people. It's mm. kind of shifts around, you know, different uh, people's priorities. So it's, it is a bit difficult. We could do better and we're trying. <laughs> oh, that's perfect. Well, listen, thank you so much, Art. I, I'm, I've got a bunch more questions here, but we have to tip along. So listen, thank you so much. And we're going to switch over to Stuart Lawn, who's coming to us from Fab Lab Maker Hub out in Leitrim. So these guys were founded in 2014. They're a mobile Fab Lab that travels to each county providing training and services to small businesses, uh, micro enterprises, schools, and community groups. So a fab lab for the uninitiated is a small scale workshop offering digital fabrication. They provide individual and creative industries with access to a wide range of digital fabrication technologies, such as 3D printers, laser cutters, vinyl cutters, CNC machines, open source electronics, and Stuart is an audio engineer. Are you, uh, he started in the music industry in London, moved over to Ireland, where he co-founded the business providing equipment, system design, and support for the film and TV industry. He moved to Leitrim in 2012, and his lifelong love of tinkering and technology led him to create the Fab Lab in the northwest of Ireland. He's currently a design and project manager for the Creative Heartlands Project, uh, and he is promoting the region all over the country. Stuart, how are you today? I'm doing good, yeah. I, hopefully you can hear me because my internet is dropping out here. That's the joys of living in rural Leitrim. <laughs> I didn't want to make a pass at it. I was just going to let it lie, but okay, we'll go for it. <laughs> no, yeah. uh, you've got a better setup than me over there. Well, you know, this 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 is my home office. Uh, the, the, the lab is uh, certainly a, a lot tidier. <laughs> well, listen, uh, uh, treat me like I'm five. Explain <laughs> a mobile fab lab to me. Okay, so um, we're not just mobile, but we do okay. have a mobile element to us. So there, there, there is an actual physical uh, <laughs> lab in, in which we do stuff. Um, but I guess it goes back to, um, well, we, when we first started, we had a fixed lab. And then we, we had some funding to get started. And then our funding kind of ran out. And so it was sort of back to working from home and, 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 and doing stuff. But we found that um, because, because people wanted us to go out to them to do workshops, be it community groups, schools, libraries, we found that we were kind of out on the road a lot anyway. So we kind of made a, a decision at one stage to just become a kind of a, a virtual mobile fab lab. Um, and most of the equipment, the thing about the thing about digital fabrication equipment these days is it's shrinking in size all the time. Um, and I can fit most of the components of a fab lab into the back of my estate car <laughs> and drive anywhere with it and have it set up within half an hour. Um, so in that regard, we were able to sort of like really get out there and do, you know, workshops, you know, across like I say, most of the Northwest. And, you know, we've gone even down to, you know, Galway, Kilkenny, Dublin, you know, you name it. We've, we've, we've been around, we've been around. <laughs> so, yeah, so that's, that's, that's really, that's really where we are. I mean, at the moment we have a, a an actual, you know, physical lab, um, but part of the, the project that I'm involved in at the moment, which is uh, Creative Heartlands, um, that is covering Sligo, Leitrim, and Roscommon, and it's a it's a project that was uh, an Enterprise Island funded project that was um, started last year, and uh, it's focusing on sort of providing um, support and access to technology to the sort of creative industries in in those regions, and it's run through the arts offices um, and uh, and local enterprise offices. So yeah, right. so that's you know that's just really kind of where we're we're at at the moment. 
there's there's a there's more than one um, mobile makerspace I should say. There's obviously Make Create and Innovates have started a mobile makerspace. I think Dublin Libraries have one now. They've got this enormous van. I think they've got a packed full of three D printers. We yeah. need to have them on the show because I I really want to have a drive around in that and just like three yeah, yeah. D print things. I can see the video thumbnail now. It's just gonna be me like three D printing and driving around Dublin. But like, <laughs> have you had much interaction with them? Has there been much um kind of conversations with other mobile makerspaces? Uh, some of them, um, the one, the one that's just about to get off the ground, um, that we're, we're kind of, uh, involved in is, um, is the one in creative spark up in Dundalk. Um, they have, they, they've managed to get some fantastic funding to, to build out, a a, a bus, a, you know, and put, um, every piece of equipment inside it and still have space to have like six people working in there. So, so their one is looking incredible. Um, so we could race the guys. Up... Race them? <laughs> oh, no, <laughs> the exactly, yeah. one versus the Dundalk one. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Um, but, but really um, it, the guys up in, in the fab lab in Derry in, in the nerve center, um, they kind of, um, they kind of gave us a tip off and basically said, look, if you just put everything in kind of like flight cases or, you know, uh, make it kind of road road worthy you can kind of turn up at a turn up at a venue you know wheel stuff in wheel stuff out and get set up in half an hour and, and that's the kind of model that we've followed is the is a kind of roll in roll out kind of kind of model um yeah, yeah. and you've obviously you got initial funding that's run out so how do you keep the lights on um by pursuing more funding <laughs> basically um yeah, so initially we 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 had a, a kind of like a a, a kind of a, a startup fund from from our local enterprise office in Leitrim, um, and there was a uh, a new kind of co-working hub, um, and they gave us a sort of space for a year, um, so that got us that got us kind of started off uh and then after that we've just been you know picking up projects and funding as as we go along like i say at the moment um the the, the project that's that, that we're that we're working on that's, that's funding it mostly is is this creative heartlands project um so that's that's a three-year enterprise island funded project so like that'll that'll keep us going you know keep for the a while on. now yeah exactly yeah and then you know we're forever kind of like talking to people about you know projects and and how we can you know how we can help them and do stuff we're we're kind of lucky in as much as where we're based in manor hamilton in leitrim if people don't know manor hamilton manor hamilton is actually very i mean leitrim itself is is a very arty county um we have the the leitrim sculpture center in manor hamilton which is um a sort of a world-class facility for for artists they have um you know, they have ceramic studios, they have metalwork studios, woodwork, you know, um, places there. They have individual studios for artists to sort of, you know, rent. And they run a, they have a huge gallery there as well where they put on shows, literally kind of there's a show on happening pretty much every um, every month. Um, so we're, we're very, you know, close to, to those guys. Um, and, you know, we do a lot of stuff together with them um, because... A lot of a lot of the people that come in through the Fab Lab, you know, would, would be from an artistic background or have some kind mm. of a creative enterprise that they're, you know, they're they're working on. Um, so yeah, that's that's kind of really where 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 we're at. And obviously, in, in contrast to Bench Space, Far Set Labs, who have more permanent spaces, would you mm. ever consider that you'd like to get a permanent makerspace, or do you want to just very much keep with the Fab Lab model? Well, we like I say, we do have a permanent space. We have a lab. We just don't have a very big space, so we can't okay. really have um, uh, people coming in to do workshops because we really don't have the space to do that. I mean, we could fit probably six people in our in our lab, and then it's it's crowded. So that's right, typically okay. why we why we go out to other venues and do workshops in other venues. Um, because we don't have yes i mean i would love to have a huge bench space um <laughs> type <laughs> facility you know and um you know there's there's discussions going on at the moment that i can't talk about um the inside scoop the, yeah you know <laughs> but let's, let's just say watch this space let's just put it like that you know um but yeah no absolutely it, it is something that is that is in in the future 
I mean, yeah. that, that's, it's absolutely amazing. And like, what's people's reactions when you show them 3D printers and laser cutters and stuff? Because I, obviously, I see there you go to an awful lot of schools now. What's uh, young people's reaction when they see these machines and how, you know, re, you know once you actually have a fairly yeah. good, someone explains them, they're not that complicated. Like a 3D printer seems oh, like the most complicated thing in the world. It's actually yeah. super, it, it's not very complicated at all. Exactly. So what, yeah, what are exactly. people's reactions to it when you show them these things? Oh, you yeah, know, like, you know, the, the, the kids, get it they totally get it they're they're of that generation that understands technology and you know you know to them you know this is just another microwave oven i stick something in and i press a button and it comes out done you know what i mean <laughs> um so you know and especially a laser cutter like like you know um like may was saying it is the gateway drug to digital fabrication because it's so instant gratification <laughs> um you know I draw it on the screen, I send it there, I hit a button and it cuts it out of a piece of acrylic for me or whatever, you know, um, it's like magic, you know, but you know, they, they totally get that the kids and they, they, you know, they, they, they and, and, and for us, it's about trying to, um, you know, move away from that idea of, you know, consuming technology to actually using technology and being creative with it, you know, um, yeah. You know, so, the, so that that's really what we're trying to trying to do. Um, and I think that's a that's a brilliant point you make there in terms of like consuming technology versus actually using it to create things. Because I know there's an awful lot of people out there who are very much sort of, you know, people get very pigeonholed in the maker community. It's like you're a painter. All right, well, I don't get involved in this, or I'm a sculptor. I don't get involved in any of that stuff. And the the day of the generalist. I feel like is um is nearly yeah. dying to a degree where everyone has to be very very niche specialized it's not only just in making it's also in most of our careers we have yeah. to be hyper specialized to do anything particular to get very far whereas the age of generalization and being a maker who can just throw their hand at everything they're, they're not amazing at everything but they're all right at just about everything i feel like that day is kind of um we're kind of closing down the amount of people we know who actually do that yeah. um <clears throat> Whereas the young people today, they're, they're they're so caught up in the technology, which is brilliant. The technology is incredible. But I wonder, are we losing something there as well, where people are going to be like, oh, well, look, I'm just going to focus on this and not involve myself in the more artistic side of things. Yeah, no, absolutely. Like, you know, all the all the kind of like workshops we do, we always, you know, that that that, that the A in, in Steam, you know, we we always try and bring in the creativity side of things and it's not just technology for technology's sake it's always showing you know you know what you could do creatively with it and, and you know that's really that's really what we're you know kind of all about you know yeah um yeah perfect well listen Stuart, thank you so much for taking the time. We're going to bring all our other guests down here now and we're going to have a round table discussion and I've had a couple of good questions here for you today. So let's bring back in Art and Maeve. Thank you so much for taking the time out of your day to come on the podcast. We've absolutely loved having you. I've got a couple of hard questions for you now. Um, but um, listen, I, I want to talk about the first big thing because we have maker spaces all over Ireland. Um, I was looking through a couple of Silicon Republic ads there, uh, not ads, uh, articles about older uh, maker spaces from about 2015. And I was going through it and I was like, that didn't make it, that didn't make it, that didn't make it. And we, we've seen an awful lot start and an awful lot not make it, which, which is terrible. But what are the biggest issues facing your spaces and your business models? Like, like what, what, what's the thing that you're most worried about? Because there's been, I've seen so many that just, they've really, really struggled to keep the lights on. And it is quite tough out there. So let's start with um, Maeve. I'd say it's a few things. Uh, possibly, do you know when the... Uh, there's probably a term for this, but when you have a change in generation from the founders to the new generation that's coming yeah. through and like the passing on of the baton. Um, so that like that passion and reasons for something starting up in the first place and the natural passing it over. Are there people there to continue it going? Obviously, because ours, like we still have a lot of volunteers with us. So certainly that bodies on ground in terms of the volunteers as well um, and insurance is a massive uh, obstacle for us yeah absolutely insurance is is, is a big one um that the the, <laughs> the prices has just gone 
ridiculous. Um, and, and, and also for us, if we're going into a venue, the venue often want us to kind of indemnify them to some degree. Yeah. So, um, so that just kind of like makes things trickier. It, it, it's just become a lot more, you know, red tape in trying to get things done. And, um, you know, you're spending a lot more time on admin and on creative stuff, which is annoying when all you want to do is do the creative stuff. Yeah. You know, yeah, for, for us, it's, it's kind of that there's a, there's a big, big cotton between properly doing things, you know, and doing the paperwork and, and the, what do you call it, the due diligence and preparation, right. Of the safety insurance and actually delivering it. And especially for a place that where the, the hacker space is us, where we're about the community, everybody here is for the community. And then going from that mindset into somebody that does paperwork and, you know, and getting more people to help with those things is it, that's a big gap. <laughs> yeah. So it seems like insurance is the real killer. Cause I know in TOG, um, I think it's fair to talk about it. It's, um, they really, really struggled with uh, their insurance and we had to stop woodworking completely in the space just before COVID. And it was like, if you've ever been to the old TOG, there is a yeah. massive workshop there. We have bandsaws, we had laser cutters, we can see this machine, a massive amount in that space. And then suddenly it was like, no, nope, no one is allowed hammer and nail in this place. And then you had a percentage of the membership whose entire makerspace was basically turned off. They had a makerspace, but they were not allowed to hammer a nail or cut a piece of wood. And it was incredible. And the prices we were looking at would bankrupt us. Um, yeah. And that must yeah. be felt right across the island. Yeah, our, like just before I started, our insurance one year was over 20,000. Um, oh. oh, I'm getting away lightly then. <laughs> now we've, we have worked quite hard and just uh, tailored our language. Um, also, we learned how to communicate with the market. There was a lot of learning to be done by us in terms mm. of how we actually communicated what bench space was, made it easy for the market to understand which we would not have known in the first place. So actually, um, because Space was um, is a member of the Design and Craft Council, because um, some of our makers will be small creative businesses, mm. um, we the Design and Craft Council do have an insurance scheme with um, Portsmouth Insurance, I think it's called, who do have a certain stream for uh, craft workers. And a lot of, like, you no, know, there, there is a membership in Design and Craft Council that is geared towards hobbyists and things like that so a lot of people could actually become members of dcci and then be as a result be able to access um the this craft insurance scheme and we were thankfully we uh someone in pork smith helped us to just uh learn how to actually talk proper insurance language um mm. but now it's still very very high um because you could lose an arm in the space um, it, it is uh, that is I mean that's what you have to do I guess to play with the big boys in some ways it's tough yeah Stuart do you limit what you do based on, on the insurance um well mostly like we don't have machines that could take your arm off unless you you know override the safety features on the laser cutter and stick your hand in there you know um the most you're going to get maybe is, you know, a burnt finger from, you know, touching a 3D printer. Um, so most of the machines that we use aren't, you know, fatal <laughs> in that regard. That's a great way of describing it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, um, you know, um, so like because they're kind of desktop machines and because we, we again, it's the, I like May said, it's around the language we use, we, 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 we essentially are a training organization. We are an, an education facility. You know. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, you know, um, so there, there's usually always somebody using, you know, administering the machine. If someone is using it or whatever in a workshop, you know, there's always somebody there that is, you know, overseeing that. So that, again, it's, it's like, like May says, it's about the language you use and about how you kind of pitch it to the thing. But um, it, it, it has, you know, as we grow, I can see that this is going to become a bench space situation where we're going to have to kind of um, uh, 
and, uh, and like we would be happy if, when, if to talk to anybody like or to share our learnings from that process and like yeah we we like i will hopefully be coming up to you guys uh yeah soon you're welcome and um, <laughs> and i think like it's about sharing that like um, yeah. sharing all yeah. that knowledge within the community yeah so when um back in well back in 2014 2015 when sort of the fab labs were getting started we had the fab foundation island um so the, the, the Fab Lab network across the world has this kind of foundation. And then uh, over here, we started the Fab Foundation Island, which was the kind of the sort of like the umbrella organization for all the Fab Labs. Um, and we were trying to kind of like, yeah, like negotiate those kind of like terms so that anybody that wanted to start a Fab Lab would be able to sort of like, you know, get, but then the Fab Foundation mm -hmm. Island ran out of funding because <laughs> we would get funding from um, Science Foundation. Um, and we lost our um, sort of chairman. Um, so yeah, like you know, it'd be great if there was like a you know an all island maker space, um, fab lab hacker space, you know, um, body that that could kind of negotiate these you know all these. Vicky, things. you write write this down. Vicky, write this down. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that was kind of Vicky's job in Dublin for a while. But <laughs> it's, it's yeah. interesting you said that. And Nathan, you know, and maybe you comment on some things. There's so many spaces spinning up, right? You know, uh, it's really hard to do this stuff. And if mm. we draw a parallel to maybe what happened with the technology companies when they started clustering, not competing and helping each other. That's how yeah. that's how it actually grew and started exploding. Like we're not competing with each other, right? We're we're trying to grow this collective community of people that are you know, involved, yeah, involved in this. Yeah. And Which I actually would, sorry, I would say it is happening in co-working hubs. It is. So, yeah. like, what's to say that, like, you know, co-making uh, makerspace yeah. hubs, couldn't, and that could, like, informal, just once a month, once every two months, meet online, just chat, what's our biggest issues, things like that. Yeah. I think that's a very, very good point, Maeve. I, I guess when we started this podcast, we were just trying to connect in some way to all the different makers across the country, because I, at least I felt that there was a real kind of divergence of there's people down here, there's people over there. And I meet maybe some of them once a year at Dublin Maker, and then I never see sight nor sound of them again, um, which, which is tough because it's so many, there's so many talented people out there and the amount of people we've been talking to um, that are going to appear in the podcast, there's such talent in this country, it would blow your mind. We have a guy who makes gates out of copper. Like he hand makes them, he hand hammers them. It's, 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 there's so many incredible people. But what, what I want to ask is, because um, I'll talk about this all day, is our, in terms of the insurance, how is it up in Belfast as opposed to, because we're talking about it from obviously from the, down the south, has that been a big issue for you up there? So we have had very good people on our board that are managing, managing these things for us over a number of years. Um, and I think through their... Um, harder and experience, they've been able to make it less of a problem for us. We are an interesting space though, because uh, we're a 24 seven space, right? We don't have mm -hmm. everyone here standing beside you. So limiting what we're doing has been the biggest way, you know, we kind of manage that, uh, that risk uh, to, to people, both, both in terms of insurance and in terms of, you know, what we feel comfortable exposing people to, because as much as you can, um, expect that somebody is not going to do something they might not be they might not know it's dangerous that's a lovely way of saying it <laughs> yeah. yeah people don't know that a, a machine could be as uh, Stuart said fatal yeah <laughs> there's yeah. definitely like i've definitely seen people in um, and i've made this mistake myself is i've seen people in spaces do what i can only describe as very idiotic things um now, I myself, I tried to sand a two by four and I ended up shooting it across the room. Not a great moment for me. And like, luckily no one was hurt. And I remember sitting there going, I wasn't paying attention. I wasn't copped on. And luckily nothing bad happened. But there's definitely been, there must have been incidents in your spaces where someone has done something just insanely silly, like putting their hand in a laser cutter and overpowering it, cutting their hand off. Art, just so excited to talk about I this. I've five fingers. He's shown his five fingers. <laughs> <laughs> this happened before my time, but oh, wait, no, I have five fingers still. <laughs> this happened before my time, but it turns out we had a, somebody 
uh, on their own volition, built a wall, a new wall in the space out of pallets. <laughs> I know that's just been that was an interesting <laughs> discovery, uh, but it was just a wonderful story to hear. <laughs> Good stuff. And like, I am for, I'm very conscious, like, like it's, it's pretty apparent the theme that's coming across is actually it's all the serious, possibly quite boring admin stuff is actually the challenges to keep mm. space yeah. alive, to keep all the fun things going. And like, that is a, it is a major element to the cogs turning in a makerspace. space one of the which things. is obviously something we don't really talk about like we, we we often think of maker spaces of oh look at these machines look at these people i can learn so much we don't think about the treasurer or the admin staff behind that or the compliance staff actually making things happen and keeping the whole ship running um, and yeah. which is probably something we should we, we, we should be very thankful to them not only just to our uh, our makers but to the people who actually do an awful lot of the admin work um so tell me covid obviously big in the news um i'm What's only that? just recovering uh well, it's a big big news <laughs> since replaced by the war but uh listen in terms of covid how has that affected your spaces because obviously they must have had to shut down and um, obviously sure you probably weren't able to travel anywhere and um, so like how did your spaces react to that did it have a really detrimental impact or do you think it's made you stronger well for us literally I got a contract to do a year's <coughs> a year's contract for a mobile fab lab. And a week later, we were in the first lockdown. So I had to pivot hard <laughs> and turn a mobile fab lab into a virtual fab lab, um, like overnight, basically. Um, so we had to rewrite all the kind of terms and conditions and contract things. Um, uh, but you know, it was good in a way because it's 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 given us what we're on now, which is these virtual platforms. We we basically pivoted. We 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 created podcasts. We started a YouTube channel. We were doing you know Facebook Live you know streams. We were you know really hitting hard on on the social media side of things, which is something I would never have done if I hadn't have been locked down. Um, so in in some respects. That it was it was great. In other respects, it's great being out on the road now and being able to actually be in front of people again because <laughs> we've missed it, you know. So yeah, that's that's how, that's kind of how it worked for me, you know. Just try to you know, um, as they say, if we're given lemons, make lemonade, you know. What about you, Maeve? I think we're still um, it like if it did fracture the community somewhat. I came on just in 2021, so COVID, like the place had been shut down already, and it's right now we're building everything back up. Our like our class, our classes usually run in the evenings during the week. All of that went, um, so it it's taken a lot to build the community back up again, mm. and like we've also kind of shifted the business or the organization structure as well, um, and there's just a lot of moving parts so they're still quite up in the air and hopefully within the next 12 months they'll settle down but certainly that sense of togetherness now saying that but before i joined bench space they bench space got um heavily involved in forming kind of a ppe project down here wow they got a whole corridor network of 3d printers from working with a lot of pharma um, guys in pharma, every, anyone who had a 3D printer utilized it. I think Benchways really drove that with those organizations. I think it was all up and down the west coast of Ireland. They got the army involved, the guys on the blood bike guys involved as well. Certainly, I think um, Benchways got on a lot of people's radars around that and tapping into a lot of the engineers that might have their 3D printers at home and things like that. So it it that did happen just before I came. So that did keep them busy. But in terms of the community within the space, that's slowly building back up now. Kind of echoing what we're hearing, it was a very fast pivot, right? But there, there are a few effects that came out of that. One, the same people may not have been able to do the work that they were doing, which meant that there was churn in terms of people doing work. And that really brought forward where our reliance is. So do we rely on one person to do something? Can somebody help them? 
is it, you know, is it easy to step in? So sustainability became a big focus over, over that time uh, where now we're investing in training people like consciously and, and learning from other organizations. For example, there's a, um, an organization QCon here that we're very got great uh, friends in that shared, look, here's how we train our volunteers, directors, managers, people coming in for just a day. So we're trying to bring that into in, into my work at Parset and 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 but the, the other stuff I do. The other things are people are even with the restrictions in, in Northern Ireland, you know, becoming quite light. People's personal comfort levels are going to remain different for a while. So if somebody's been a loyal member for us, right, they've, they've been helping us, you know, they've been in touch. They they are they they are part of our community. There are fewer people staying home that, that are coming in uh, for us at least, but. We, we can't just you know ignore people and say look we're just going to cater to to something you know that's the 80 percent because these are people that are part of our community um, yeah. so that's going to be a hard thing <laughs> hard thing to manage for the while with training people doing this uh and, and pivoting quickly tell me now we've obviously got a hacker space we've got a maker space and then we've got a mobile fab lab these are three you know, they, they are distinctly different. They're appealing to different to groups. Like obviously, maybe you're appealing to people who want to become professionals. Uh, you also have that open part where you're getting makers in uh, art. You obviously are having more the kind of the tog way of doing things where you have it's very much a community led organization and you have people coming in and working on different projects. And then Stuart, obviously, you're going to the people. So like there's there's that. Do you think do you feel very comfortable with where your space is or do you think that each one is very, very important. And there's a reason why they're so distinct because often we use the terms interchangeably. And I often go, there actually is a, a clear difference because bench space does it in a very similar way to other maker spaces. And then uh, obviously Farset does it very similar to TOG. And then obviously Stuart, very, very similar to Make, Cre uh, Make Create Innovate. And now as I find out, uh, Creative Spark. So do you think there's an overlap or do you think that overlap will continue into the future? I, th I think everybody has a chance to do everything we we kind of started mobile out of necessity if if we'd have been gifted a a big warehouse we would have you know stayed in a big warehouse probably i don't know maybe not but you know um but i think i think that that you know that ability to kind of you know serve the serve the location you're in that's the thing that's the thing about every make every maker space is different by necessity of where they are you know the location, the demographics of the people around them, you know, the kind of who they're, who they're serving, you know, and also the people that, that get involved and set up the thing, obviously, you know, bench space, there was some really skilled woodworking people that started that, you know, in, you know, um, so yeah, I'm not answering your question, am I? <laughs> so let's say from a bench space point of view, Fergus Summers, I am, one of the founders, he's a lecturer in furniture making in one of the colleges in Cork. And so what Ben Space came about was he saw all his graduates one day surrounded by so much tools, equipment, support. Next day, nothing. nothing. And there was nowhere in the region for anybody to start uh, any form of woodwork creative business. So that's kind of how Ben Space came about. And that, so then the idea is that you have your space, but also we as well from the Enterprise Ireland uh, funding, we'll have a range of enterprise supports around that to support them. So it's not just it's not just about the space, it's about the supports as well. So for like that's I like um what Stuart said in terms of how it came about. So that's how Bent Space came about. And then different people joined at different stages who had a passion for for different elements of it. Our, our like our board are all voluntary. They all come from kind of different backgrounds as well. So we do have we do target like as in people who are hobbyists and sometimes they want to remain as hobbyists but they still want to develop new skills and that's not to say yeah. that they don't contribute to the creative economy in court they certainly do because i'm like they have disposable income to spend on membership in spaces so like it's i think we there is no we we kind of sit in that juicy little point between all of the type of spaces you know it's interesting you were talking about this graduate thing uh one thing that i this is a, a kind of a personal view on this is whenever i was doing technology in uh, high school so like in a, around a level so 16 17 18 that this is really cool stuff 
I'm not going to have any any of this whenever I leave. So I left school and I thought, you know, one day, maybe when I'm 40 years old, I'm going to, you know, I was basically picturing a makerspace. And then it turns out these things exist, <laughs> right? So the, the kind of stuff I'm trying to do is how do you pursue it? You know, if you don't pursue a STEAM degree, you will not have the school. So you can either go to university, and that's multiple years, a lot of money. You can get a job, which is a full-time commitment. But how else can you actually develop your skills? Because a lot of the time, it's very incidental how we find opportunities, right? If something's beside you, you kind of go after it, and then you, know, you, you end up going down that line. In terms of the, the, these, these differences, I think one question that popped up, certainly for me, all of us, we can be doing very different things, right? You know, you could be in any line of business you want. You could be anything. We chose makerspaces. So a question with the pressures, you know, of, of the quick pivoting and the, the high workloads on fewer people kind of makes you ask, why am I doing this or why are we doing this? And I think that brought a lot of clarity, you know, for us as to like what we want to focus on and who we're doing this for, uh, for our space. Well said, Art. Well said. Listen, I'm going to one final question and then I'm going to let you all go about your day. The maker movement in Ireland is obviously growing. As Art said, there's different things spinning up. There's so much interest. There seems to be a huge amount of support from the different councils, from the local county councils, from enterprise boards. This is becoming a serious business and a serious uh, movement in Ireland. So as more spaces are spinning up and as more people are trying to become makers and join the maker movement in Ireland, what advice would you give to people uh, either in the maker movement or setting up their own maker space? Just let, 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 whatever you think would be the best bit of advice. Uh, we'll start with we'll start with Art. Get to go first. <laughs> so, <laughs> one, one thing I really learned, and this this is through multiple ways, is to iterate. So figure out what's the smallest thing you can do quickest. You'll be able to either repeat it if it's good enough. You'll be able to change it, but you will be you'll be noticing progress very quickly. It's if you're pre-planning a lot then it's easy to fall short before delivering anything and before trying any ideas and being in maker spaces of all about trying things. I was going to say network, network, network. That really stood to us when we first got started, which was basically talk to anyone and everyone who would, you know, give you five minutes so you can pitch your idea to them and see if they want to come on board or, or you could help them or they could help you. That, that really is what I would say to do because that's that's what we did and, and, and it kind of it kind of worked for us especially if you're kind of in, like like we are in a kind of a semi semi rural area you know Sligo is literally only 50 minutes up the road so it's not that rural when you, you know, when you're not in a big a big city you got to pull in the favors from from people all around you so yeah um I would definitely say both of those things um even though I I should practice it as well as preach it um, don't aim for perfect, just get it done. So similar to what Art said in relation to iterations um, networking massively, reaching out to people, seeing how they've done. And also like looking at other models, if it's, if it works, what's the point of changing it in the very beginning? You can feel it, then adapt it to whatever you think that your space needs. But certainly look outside, see what's being done in other spaces, if it works for them, it might work for you. You don't need to reinvent the wheel. Perfect. I, I couldn't say it any better myself. And guys, thank you all so much for coming on the Irish Maker podcast. It's absolutely brilliant to talk to you. Hopefully we'll get out to your spaces soon and I will chat to all of you soon. Thank you. And that is it from the Irish Makers podcast. A big thank you to our sponsor, Coding Grace, to Vicky Toomey Lee, who manages our production for the podcast, and to all its listeners. If you want to learn more about Makerspaces featured on the show today, you can catch all their information down in the below section. If you also want to add, we also have added a bunch of Makerspaces throughout Ireland who didn't appear on the show, and you can find them if one is in your local area. We'll be back with our next episode where we'll be things will be heating up and we will be talking to blacksmiths and knife makers you can follow the irish makers podcast on twitter instagram and tiktok and please subscribe to our youtube channel you can listen to the spot the podcast on spotify and on anchor or you can watch the full podcast on youtube all links are down below in the description if you want to be featured on the irish makers podcast and we would love to have you on or have any additions to our maker news roundup which is doing really really well we'd encourage you to send in 
all the information you can. If you've got a maker event, if you've got something going on throughout the island, tell us. We'll put it on the uh, Maker News Roundup and we will put it on blast. Thank you so much for tuning in and keep making. <laughs>